From the Big Bang to now, observing the universe with the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, as a Nobel laureate in physics, Dr. Mather is truly someone we can say needs no introduction. However, he certainly deserves one on this occasion. So as stated in his official biography, Dr. Mather is a senior astrophysicist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Dr. Mather grew up on a dairy research station at Rutgers University in New Jersey, where his father worked. And at a young age, he developed a passion for building new instruments to observe space. Naturally, he went on to earn a bachelor's degree in physics at Swarthmore College, and then a PhD degree in physics from the University of California at Berkeley, working under Professor Paul Richards. During this time, he began his long journey on the measurement of the cosmic background radiation with unprecedented precision. His remarkable 20-year effort is described in a wonderful book that he wrote in 1999 or 1996 called The Very First Light. I have a copy with me right here. It describes the challenges of launching very sensitive instruments into space, the management of large teams towards achieving a big goal, the thrills of watching your payload being launched by a Delta rocket during the early hours of the day, and the immense relief and excitement of getting good data streaming from the satellite. So I recommend that all of you young students in the audience read this inspiring story and find your own calling to make an impact on humanity like Dr. Mather has done. And now we have the privilege of hearing about it from the man himself. I give you Dr. John Mather. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was a lovely introduction and a brief one. And uh, I should add one particular point. Uh, things don't go according to plan. <laughs> Uh, many of you might think, well, we've had such great success, and so it must mean that you're brilliant. But it doesn't. It means there's an awful lot of luck in the, along the way. And uh, just to add one little bit to the story, my, my, the satellite project that Jay mentioned that measured the Big Bang so precisely was based on my thesis project, which failed. <laughs> so if your particular project happens to be failing at the moment, uh, there will be a way for you to go ahead. It may not be that one, but it's something else will turn up. So I want to uh, show you um, a little bit of the history of the universe and how people found out about it and um, what we might do next. So I have uh, much to tell you. So the James Webb Space Telescope will come part way through the talk. I want to give you some of the introduction uh, about how we know about the universe and uh, what we're doing to learn more about it. So. Um, if you want to know how did we get to have a telescope, well, the first uh, hint that we might know about telescopes goes back to Leonardo da Vinci. So not everybody knows of this. Uh, it may not be true, uh, but there is a sketch he drew here which may be a sketch implying that a telescope like the Newtonian telescope with a concave parabolic reflector could actually have been built. Now, he didn't know how to build a good enough one, and we didn't see a real one that we know of. Uh, but he at least was thinking about telescopes in 1513, um, over 500 years ago. So the first real one that we got to use for astronomy was like this one. This is a Galileo telescope from about 1609. And in those days, we did it with two lenses, a concave, uh, convex lens on one end of a tube and a concave one on the other. And with that one, uh, he was able to make these drawings of, for instance, the surface of the moon which revealed for the first time that it was not a perfect sphere as uh, had been suggested by Aristotle and had been asserted by many people who didn't know any better. So um, he got in trouble for uh, pointing these things out. And uh, actually, it was, he was one of the most uh, famous physicists of his time. But he also managed to be rude to people, including the pope, who had been his friend. So um, personal behavior matters a little bit, too. Um, 
Anyway, he did get uh, us started with modern astronomy, and so we celebrated uh, 400 years of astronomy already in 2009. This year, by the way, is the uh, celebration of the International Year of Light, and so uh, optical engineers are having a good time this year. Um, anyway, astronomers always have a good time with light because it's our main tool. So um, I'd like to surprise you perhaps a little bit. Uh, when you look around the room and you think, where did we come from? Uh, we came from exploded stars. So all of the atoms that you're made of were inside a star at one time. It's a pretty startling conclusion. Uh, and you might say, well, how do you know that, smart person? Uh, and the answer is that uh, we know that the early universe gave us hydrogen and helium gas, and that was it. So the only other available place where nuclear reactions could occur to produce the carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, iron, everything that we're made of is in stars. So it's a pretty short deduction, but it took us a long time to figure this out. So uh, when you look in the mirror in the morning, you are looking at exploded stars every day. So cosmology meets cosmetology. <laughs> so a little bit about how we came to this conclusion. We astronomers look back in time by looking at things that are far away. Uh, and you might recognize a hand drawing here. This is a drawing I made about 30 years ago. And of course, I uh, keep on showing it because it's has a certain charm of simplicity. Uh, anyway, if you uh, imagine how fast does light go, it goes this far in one nanosecond, a billionth of a second. Uh, it takes uh, 500 seconds for the light to get here from the sun. Uh, if you could uh, see all the way back to the beginning of time, it would be about 15 billion years on this chart. The actual current number is 13.8, so I wasn't too far off. So how do you know how far you're looking you know, back in time? You know how the speed of light, and you have to just measure a distance. So uh, we do it by the ways that you would learn in high school uh, uh, mathematics uh, and geometry. Uh, we draw a triangle. If you know uh, one side of a triangle and two angles, then you know the whole shape of the triangle. So this is surveying, uh, as we've known how to do for a couple of thousand years. Um, if that doesn't work because the angles of the triangle are unmeasurably close to zero, then uh, we use the method called the standard candle method. So if uh, I see two objects, let's see my pointer smart enough. See, there's, there's my one candle and there's the other candle. Uh, if you look at them and you say one is, the, 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 we really believe these candles are identical, but the one is fainter, we say it's just fainter because it's farther away. So this gives us a method of relative distance measurements. And so these are our two tools. So using this, we can now survey the universe uh, and find out the distance of everything. Uh, the next thing you'd like to know is, well, how do things move? Well, things move, uh, some of them, like the planets or the moon, clearly move across the sky during the day or the night. Um, but most of the things that are far away well, do not move enough to notice. So you have to do something else. So we do something called the Doppler method, which uh, was recognized in the 19th century. Uh, you can hear it with your own, own ears with sound waves. If a motorcyclist passes you there on the interstate, uh, suddenly the pitch of the engine drops dramatically as the motorcycle passes you. So this very similar effect occurs with light waves. So now uh, we can tell how fast something is coming toward us or going away from us by the change of the wavelength of light that we receive from it. And so now we just have to know, well, what was the original wavelength? What was the pitch of the motorcycle engine when it wasn't moving? So uh, nature gave us little things to put in stars called atoms. And uh, so if you were to spread out the sunshine with a prism and do it very, very well, you would see there were dark marks across the spectrum of the sun dark marks across the rainbow, and each one is due to some chemical constituent of the sun that stops light from coming out at that particular wavelength. So now we know uh, what was the original wavelength of light coming out from, from those chem chemical constituents. Now we look at another star or a galaxy and we see a similar pattern. We say, well, number one, it must be a similar object to have the similar pattern. And number two, we can see, well, is everything different because of the motion? So now we can say an object is coming toward us or going away from us by the change of the wavelength of light that we receive. And because nature gave us these wonderful markers, uh, we can tell and measure very precisely. So this is how we survey the universe and determine how it's moving. So um, then we said, well, let's build some big telescopes. So uh, one particular guy, uh, George Ellery Hale, an American from Chicago, uh, was a young, wealthy guy, and he managed to decide that he wanted to be an astronomer and that what we needed was big telescopes. So he persuaded rich people around Chicago, which was like the S Silicon Valley of today, um, where immense amounts of money were being made, he persuaded rich friends to spend money on telescopes. 
So the four largest telescopes in the world, uh, in sequence, were built by him. So the Yerkes refractor up in uh, Williams Bay, Wisconsin, which is not a good place to put a telescope. Um, and then the 60-inch reflector and the 100-inch reflector on Mount Wilson in, in uh, California. And finally, the great 200-inch reflector in Mount Palomar in California. These were all his doing. Uh, and a totally amazing man. Um, a dynamo of energy, a person who would run up a mountain, who could speak many languages, and especially could persuade rich people to give lots and lots of money uh, to build a great telescope. So that's how the United States became the world leader in astronomy, because of that one, one guy. <coughs> now I want to jump into <coughs> a little bit of the history of uh, science and engineering. Uh, here's Erwin Schrodinger here on the left, uh, a guy who gave us quantum mechanics. And uh, if you're not an engineer or a scientist, you might think quantum mechanics is really mysterious. If you are an engineer or a scientist, you know that we use it every day and that everything I've got in my hands is based on it. The computer works because of quantum mechanics. I see because of quantum mechanics. And it's a routine tool. Anyway, he gave us the first uh, wave equation for these things, and we use it all the time. <clears throat> and, uh, and then in 1926, um, Robert Goddard built us a, the first liquid-fueled rocket and flew it from Worcester, Massachusetts. And uh, the New York Times announced that this could not possibly work because it wasn't pushing on anything. Um, I guess th they were wrong. <coughs> so uh, we actually use his name as the name of the NASA center where I work. Uh, so and then what do we have here? Here's Einstein uh, uh, standing here with uh, Georges Lemaitre, who was one of the people who figured out that the universe must be expanding. Einstein said that could not possibly be true. Uh, but it was true. Anyway, another thing to point out is uh, Georges Lemaitre is a Catholic priest, and as well as an MIT physicist, an MIT PhD physicist. Uh, so he worked out Einstein's equations, applied them to the universe, said the universe must be expanding, must have come from a primeval atom, 1927. And he wasn't even the first. Uh, that was done first uh, by a Russian physicist who died three years after he figured it out, and so he didn't find out that he was correct. So. Uh, Anyway, 1927, uh, George Lemaitre told us it must be so. Einstein said, no, it can't be. 1928, radio astronomy began because an engineer, uh, Jansky, Carl Jansky, built this uh, radio uh, antenna and discovered that the signal that came from it changed during the day. Uh, and that was a noisy signal. Um, there were no transmitters to speak of, no people transmitting. So eventually realized that there were two sources, this, the Milky Way galaxy that we live in and the sun. So the beginning of radio astronomy. And not much was done with that for a while because technology was primitive when all you could get was a vacuum tube uh, to amplify something. But nevertheless, it was good enough that he could detect uh, the beginning of radio astronomy. So jumping ahead a little bit more, here is Edwin Hubble. Uh, sitting at the uh, focus of one of those big telescopes. This is the 100-inch Mount Wilson telescope. Uh, in those days, to get a time exposure, what you had to do was stare through an eyepiece and make sure they, a star would sit still on the uh, crosshairs of the telescope so we'd get a sharp picture. So he had to do that for many, many hours to get uh, his images of the deep sky. Uh, and when he did that enough, he was able to make this plot. And what the plot shows is uh, galaxies. Every galaxy, um, you know, we. The sun orbits in a, in a Milky Way galaxy, which has about a couple of hundred billion stars orbiting around a common center, held together by gravity. Uh, in 1929, it wasn't yet clear that the Milky Way wasn't alone. Uh, but in those days, uh, it was just beginning to be known that uh, distant galaxies, little fuzzy dots in the sky, were actually made out of stars, and that you could measure their distances and their speeds of motion. So this is what he did. He made a graph. This is the first graph of this. And so each of these dots is a galaxy. Here's his measured estimated distance. He did it with that standard candle method. Here's the speed that he measured, or some of these are other people's measurements, actually. Anyway, you see two things. One is almost all the galaxies are going away. And number two is there's a trend. The faster away, the farther, the farther away, the faster they're going. So if you want to know how old is this pattern, how old is the universe, divide the distance by the speed, which is the, I guess that's the inverse of the slope of this line, you can get the age of the universe, 1929. So if uh, people say, well, Big Bang Theory, like that's somehow a put down, 
Big Bang has been known um, from measurements since 1929. So the economists will remember 1929 for a different reason, because we discovered worldwide economic collapse. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, world, uh, universal cosmic expansion also demonstrated by measurement in 1929. So we call this Hubble's law. Now Hubble actually gave us a puzzle as a result also because the age that he got was incorrect. He got two billion years and the actual age is about 14. So this was a problem because it didn't take too long before we calculated that the Earth is older than the universe. So for a long time this was a problem. And it didn't get finished for until about 1996 or so. Anyway, uh, so Edwin Hubble gave us the law that we know, know him for and of course for which we we named a great telescope in space. Now, jumping ahead a little bit more in time, uh, here is the uh, father of modern space telescopes, Lyman Spitzer. Uh, after World War II, wrote a little report for the Rand Corporation. He said, we should build telescopes and put them in space. And uh, working on the defense side of things, he was perfectly well aware you would use them to look down uh, at the Earth. But he also said, we should build them to look out. And he said, uh, sort of this more, most extreme suggestion was, why, why don't we find an asteroid and polish a parabolic surface into, this, into it so that we could image distant stars and see planets orbiting around other stars? 1946, he was thinking pretty far ahead. So we did actually build a telescope in space and name it after him as well. So here is Fred Hoyle uh, in Britain, uh, driving on the other side of the road. He's a guy who hated the Big Bang Theory and actually gave it the name that you know it by. Uh, he thought it was preposterous that the universe would have a beginning, that it surely must be going on for an infinite amount of time. Uh, so um, on a radio broadcast, he called it the Big Bang Theory as a kind of put down. Um, but we can't shake the name because it's stuck. Um, it's a very misleading name because it suggests that the universe started with an event uh, at a place and a time, just like a firecracker going off. But it's a completely inadequate name to suggest an infinite universe expanding infinitely into itself. So uh, because of him, we have a almost 100% confusion about what is going on. Uh, so then in 1946, I turned up. <laughs> and I didn't have a clue what was going to happen next. So what happened next? Well, uh, here in 1948, uh, these three gentlemen uh, basically worked out that the universe was hot in the beginning and were thinking about how did the elements get made. Uh, so they calculated two things. One, uh, there should be a particular ratio between the hydrogen and the helium content, and they got it about right. And number two, um, the universe should be filled with heat. Uh, that must have been there at the beginning, at, at least in early times, and we should be able to calculate the temperature. So they did this several times where they got about five degrees Kelvin, five degrees above absolute zero, which is pretty close to the current answer of 2.7. So they predicted it and nobody went to look. It would have been hard, but nobody tried. Uh, then in, uh, in the early 50s, uh, people were going to go see if Mars was alive. Uh, this is a drawing of Mars uh, made by people on the ground with a telescope and they saw canals on Mars. <coughs> So it's pretty good of evidence now that these are the blood vessels in the back of the observer's eye. <coughs> so sorry about that. But they were very convinced, and they seemed to see the same thing. Uh, they were pretty sure. Anyway, now if you uh, have an eye, if you've got an eye doctor in the house, they could probably say, that's what it really does look like inside your eye. Um, Anyway, so 54, that's about when I went to the Museum of Natural History in New York and I got all excited about the space and the possibility that maybe Mars is alive. Anyway, it isn't, sorry, at least maybe not. So then, in 1957, the space age began with the Sputnik. And so suddenly this country went from, uh, well, it's interesting uh, science, but we better defend ourselves against that Soviet Union. So suddenly uh, an even larger flood of money and interest came around and so science fairs sprang up all around the country. Uh, things were offered to people like me. I was like 11 years old. Wouldn't you like to do something? So absolutely yes. So uh, the country spent a fortune on bringing in science and engineering and it has paid off. I think uh, when you look around at the world leadership that we have, probably the Soviet Union's uh, Sputnik was one of the big key events. What else happened? Uh, well, we, we've been building big telescopes. So here is one that we built. This is a British one. 
This is the Jodro Bank Telescope, the, which was actually used to listen to the Sputnik when it went over. Uh, they've discovered many amazing things with it, uh, in, including quasars. I don't have time to tell you much about all these things, but this is a huge telescope. Um, and it's been, and it's old. And we built some more. Uh, and then, uh, as a consequence of the Sputnik, we said, well, better start NASA. So here's the first page of the document that starts NASA, Congressional Legislation. There shall be NASA. And among other things, they told us to tell the world what we find. I think we're the only federal agency that has that in our congressional formation document, uh, which is kind of amazing. But they were farsighted in those days. And they thought, this is not just, well, anyway, they knew we had to compete with the Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, it wasn't very long. Uh, it was just four year, five years, af four years after the formation of NASA that John Kennedy was at Rice University to give this speech. And I'll try to play it for you. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, by the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. That was a pretty amazing speech. And uh, still gives me goosebumps to remember what he said. Uh, and notice that he didn't say we weren't going to do the other things. We're not going to give up taking care of the people. We're going to the, go to the moon and we're going to do all the other things. He said it was possible, and it was. But it's just hard. So uh, now I want to show you uh, the guy who made it happen. This is James Webb, the same guy that we uh, name our telescope after. He um, went to President Kennedy with the plan to go to the moon. And by the way, on his way in the taxi cab, he decided he better double the budget request. <laughs> so he did his risk analysis. And he said, if we got halfway there and we run out of money, this is a disaster. So uh, he knew that he shouldn't always trust the, the measurements and calculations of optimists like scientists and engineers. We are kind of optimistic, you know. We don't. Anyway, I don't need to tell you. <laughs> So then a little while later, in 1965, uh, cosmology uh, began to, with uh, the beginning, with it is a, a big step in cosmology began with the, this uh, radio receiver and antenna, where they finally detected the heat radiation of the early universe that had been predicted by Alpha and Hermann and Gamow back in 1948. So uh, they got their Nobel Prize for it uh, quite a few years later, but uh, nobody was looking. They were not looking for this radiation at the time. It was a surprise to them. They were really good astronomers and really good engineers. And they said, there's noise coming into our receiver. We don't like that. We must understand it. And finally, they tracked it down. And somebody else told them what it meant. But they had proved that it was not in the equipment. Then uh, more telescopes were built, radio telescopes. This uh, measured quasars. A quasar is basically, now we know it's a black hole with stuff falling in. Um, here's a relatively nearby, extremely large telescope. This is a telescope um, whose diameter is greater than the length of a football field. Uh, it's a 100-meter telescope. And um, it's a fully steerable parabolic antenna. It is so large. I've been up to stand by the, di by the top of the dish. And it is so large, you cannot tell how large it is. <laughs> then there is an even bigger one. Uh, we have this one. It's 1,000 feet across. It's a, a big concave sphere hanging in a valley in Puerto Rico. And uh, they figured out how to use a spherical reflector to make a radio telescope. This is so powerful that you can send radar beam from there to uh, Venus and get the bounce back, come to the other telescope I just showed you, and make a map of Venus. And, and actually watch that there's a volcano on Venus which will erupt from time to time. So it's totally astonishing what we've got. Now I want to show you the project that I did with my team at NASA. This is called the Cosmic Background Explorer. And this is the one that basically was my thesis project, only it worked. So um, in, uh, 
1974, I got out of graduate school with a thesis that had failed. Well, the project failed. I got to write a thesis anyway, my thanks, my good advisor. Um, we said, uh, shortly after, I had moved to NASA to get a job to do something completely different. I thought my thesis work was too hard. But um, NASA said, not uh, request for proposals. This is just five years after we landed on the moon. What is NASA going to do next? Ask, a str ask the scientists what they want to do. They thought they'd get a dozen proposals. They got 150 proposals. And our proposal was one of ones that was chosen. So we got to go ahead and build it uh, after a great deal of difficulty and change. And uh, we built it to launch on the space shuttle. And the space shuttle exploded. And we had to rebuild it. And anyway, many, many changes. We sent it up finally 15 years after it was first suggested. And right away, we got a curve which confirmed the expanding universe story a.k.a. the Big Bang Theory, but don't believe that word. Um, so what this chart shows you is that the um, brightness of the radiation on the vertical direction matches the theoretical curve, which is the smooth uh, curve here, exactly. And so um, eventually we got the error bars so small you can't see them, but this was the, within weeks after launch, we were able to make this chart. So we got a standing ovation to show, for showing this chart to the astronomers, and uh, I thought, why are they giving it such a high praise? Didn't they know that was the right answer? Because uh, I thought I knew the answer in the back of the book. But they knew that we didn't know. And so this was of revolutionary importance. And it proved that this huge investment that we had made in the project uh, had paid off. A couple of years later, we made another announcement. Uh, and when Stephen Hawking saw this chart, he said it was the scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. So now I have to tell you what it is. Um, <laughs> What this is is a map of the sky uh, made with this heat radiation from the early universe. Uh, and the, the uh, net result at the bottom, after taking out all the local effects, is a map that shows hot and cold spots, blobs in the Big Bang. And these blobs are very faint. They're 30 micro degrees above and below average. And, um, and the, the map is kind of fuzzy, because that's all we could do with that equipment. Uh, but this was the first detection of this pattern. And now we know that several things. Number one, we wouldn't be here if it weren't like that, because gravity operating on the early variations of density in the Big Bang material was able to stop the expansion of material, turn it around, and make it fall back down in to make galaxies and stars. So we are here because of those blobs. Second thing, which we didn't know for sure at the time, is that most of those blobs are due to dark matter. You've heard of cosmic dark matter, which is called dark, but it should be called transparent because we can't see it. Uh, but it has most of the gravity in the universe. And because of that dark matter making those blobs, we are here. So in case you should think that uh, dark matter is just one of those things astronomers like, just remember you need it. You, you wouldn't be here without it, even though you can't see it or feel it. So uh, we were really happy with that. And we got lots of uh, praise for it. But a few years later, my friends, uh, built another mission, another NASA mission, with uh, Princeton University. And they made an even better map. So now you can see much more detail. As far as we know, this pattern is random. It, and you see, pattern, you see continents and oceans, and perhaps in this pattern. As far as we know, it's just random numbers. <laughs> but nevertheless, you can interpret the pattern and learn a vast amount. So if this pattern enables us to measure everything about the expanding universe with a few percent precision, which is totally astonishing to me. When we set off in 1974 to build our satellite, we had no clue that that would ever happen, uh, that we would measure anything. Uh, it seemed possible, but nobody knew what we should measure. Now, extraordinarily uh, better results. So now, um, uh, perhaps some surprises. Uh, a lot of people ask me, where is the center of this expansion? Where, is the, where, did, where was the Big Bang? And I have to explain to you that there is not a center or an edge. <coughs> so this is an uh, illustration of that. Uh, uh, imagine my three astronomers here. And imagine this is drawn from the perspective of the person. Um, so um, look at these uh, numbers. They would, uh, the person here would say, well, I think the, uh, the race started an hour ago. And I think I'm at the beginning. I'm not going anywhere. So. She says she's at the center of the universe. But now calculate what the tortoise would say. Um, she, she would get the same answer for the age of the universe, one hour. Um, but she could claim that she was in the middle. 
So just to think there's no grass in outer space. Nobody knows who's running and who's not. So because you cannot tell the difference between one place and another, and because uh, Hubble's plot is a straight line, it implies that there is no center of the universe. And we have, of course, been checking this, and so there is still no center of the universe. So the center is there. The center is everywhere. He went that away. Whatever you want to say, there is no center. Uh, there is probably no edge, although there is a limit to how far you can see. So uh, do I know that this is true? No, I only have some evidence. Um, obviously, I could not really know the secrets of the universe. But maybe it does excuse me from drawing you a picture uh, of the Big Bang, because you cannot stand outside the universe to draw a picture of the universe. So maybe I'm excused from that. Um, so do not try. If they draw you a picture of, a, of an explosion, they're drawing you a little bang. I mean the infinite bang. How about an infinite bang? So here's our story that I told you very briefly about how we got here. The, the hot and cold spots in the Big Bang material are actual density variations. So gravity acting on those denser regions will stop them from expanding, turn around, turn us into, get us stars and, and planets. And after the, this happens, then all the complexities of chemistry and physics can now occur. So that's why the universe is not just a featureless gas. So what are we going to do next for astronomy? Well, I'll draw you a few more telescopes. This is one that is currently being completed in the Andean Desert at an altitude of about 16,000 feet, where it's unsafe to go without oxygen if you're a normal person. And uh, this is a collection of about 64 radio telescopes operating at a wavelength of a few millimeters. Uh, and this is one of their most beautiful and famous pictures. This is a place, this is a new star which is forming planets. This is a picture of dust grains orbiting around the star in the middle. And you can see there are gaps in this where we think planets have formed and they have started to soak up the dust grains. So is this going to be a solar system? Yeah, I think so. Is it going to be like the solar system? Well, who knows? because it could out, turn out to be quite different. But this is the beginning of our tools to directly see how solar systems form. We can see it doing it. We're building another telescope. It's called the Square Kilometer Array. Can you imagine a uh, telescope as big as the campus? Well, not quite as big as the whole campus, but a square kilometer. Um, basically, they said, you have to make the telescope that's cheaper than room carpet to be able to afford it. Uh, but they figured out how, so they are building this telescope uh, with a square kilometer collecting area, and they've divided it into two parts, a part in Western Australia and a part here in Southern Africa. Uh, both places are chosen because there's no cell phone service there, uh, which means nobody lives there, and it's quiet. So this telescope is so powerful that they say that uh, if there's anybody with an airport radar on a planet around another star nearby, we would know. So it's not exactly SETI to see if there's intelligent life, but if there were airport radars, it would surely be an interesting sign. <laughs> so now I want to show you another amazing invention called adaptive optics. Um, back in the 1970s, this was invented uh, by friends of mine at Berkeley and others, and immediately classified because it was, uh, had more, immense importance for defense. Uh, then it was reinvented by uh, French astronomers in the 90s, and so they said, well, we can't keep it secret anymore. Let's tell everybody about it. And so now this is a way we now have to correct for the shimmering atmosphere. When you look across a field in the summer, you just see the distant bushes are dancing around, and you can't get a sharp picture. Um, we have the same problem with telescopes even on a mountaintop. So people said, well, what are we going to do about that? Uh, and the answer is, uh, you make a little deformable mirror. We call it a rubber mirror or something, and we put it over here. Uh, there. This thing isn't working well enough to show you. Anywhere where it says adaptive mirror, you uh, change the shape of this mirror just a little bit to correct for the dancing of the atmosphere. And now you can get a brilliantly sharp picture. So uh, we've got these in operation at all the big observatories around the world now. And now I want you to look at the right-hand picture. The same sketch practically, except they've got a human eyeball at the upper right corner instead of a distant star. So this means that in many eye doctor's offices, they have the same kind of equipment with the same mathematics. And uh, the eye doctor can look in and get a better picture of your eye. And if you say, doctor, doctor, I want to see a lot better, they can say, OK, we will uh, measure the shape of your eye. We will make a small correction. We'll go in with our laser, and we'll fix up the shape of your eye so you can have about um, 2010 vision if you want. 
So as I understand it, the, every football player has to have this now. So uh, we have made this amazing transformation from uh, the defense industry to football. And who would have expected that? So if anybody wants to know how we benefited from mathematics and astronomy, uh, millions of people can get this. So what are we doing next? We have telescopes on the ground that are much larger than what we can put in space, and we already have some. Um, these on the left-hand side are about 10 meters, about 33 feet across the mirror, so uh, much larger than that beautiful Palomar telescope. In Chile, they have four of them parked next to each other, eight meters across, and they can even work together to, to make sharper images. But that's not good enough, so we are, worldwide we are now working on three much larger telescopes, um, the Giant Magellan Telescope, um, which will be in Chile, the 30-meter telescope, which is causing trouble in Hawaii because the Hawaiian population doesn't all want their man mountain covered with telescopes, uh, and the European Extremely Large uh, Telescope, which is going into Chile, and uh, that one is, uh, the diameter is about the width of a football field. And of course, you cannot get a piece of glass that big, so it's made out of thousands of little smaller pieces of glass, and then you can get them up the mountain. So they've already started building their telescope, too. So um, I don't know what they're going to find, but it will be magnificent. Now I want to talk a little bit about space telescopes. Uh, here's the Hubble Space Telescope. It is already 25 years old. It was launched a few months after that COBE satellite that I showed you that I worked on. Um, it is very doing, it's been, we've been five times to visit it, to upgrade it and make it better. And many of you remember that when we launched it, it was not in focus. So we had to give it its eyeglasses itself. Did that, it works beautifully. And uh, it has taken some of our most beautiful pictures too. I'll show you a few of them just to give you a hint about what we hope to see even in the future. So here is uh, a picture of the sky taken where there was nothing to look at. The director of the Space Telescope Science Institute said he was going to spend a couple of weeks of his discretionary time to look in this place where there were hardly any stars and hardly any galaxies to find. He just thought it would be interesting. Of course, he, had, he was smart. He had a good reason. Um, but people had predicted incorrectly that galaxies all formed very recently, and so that, no, there would be nothing to find here. So have we, have we got the ability to turn on, down the lights here a little bit? I don't remember how to do this. Um, well, anyway, if we can turn down the lights a little bit, you'll be able to see that, oh, the other way. <laughs> Thank you. You can see that there actually are thousands of galaxies in this picture. Galaxy, as, as I said, is a, hundreds of billions of stars orbiting a common center, and we do not know how they formed. Uh, we got it wrong. In fact, uh, this, was, this picture was a big surprise to astronomers. Uh, what we got wrong was that uh, galaxies formed very quickly after the ex universe started expanding. Um, so within a few hundred million years, there were already little galaxies, and they grew quickly. And this was absolutely f not expected. So <clears throat> this is just a reminder that astronomers almost never have enough imagination to get it right the, f uh, the first time, because the universe is much more interesting than our, we can ever imagine. So that's what the distant ones look like. Um, here's a very beautiful nearby one. It's called the Whirlpool Nebula for an obvious reason. This one's been known since the 18th century, um, but they didn't know that it was quite so beautiful. So this, you can see that there are actually two galaxies close together. They're presumably in the, uh, about to join together, and merge together in a kind of wonderful collision. Uh, you can see now that this one's made out of things that might be stars, and the different colors refer to different things that are happening. Uh, there are dark zones going through this, which are because there are dust grains in space that intercept starlight. Anyway, stars are being born here. We can tell this in tremendous detail. Now I'll show you uh, something that justifies a story that I told you at the beginning. I told you that uh, you, you're, when you look in the mirror, you're looking at exploded stars. Here's an exploded star. Now this one went off in AD 1054, as uh, recorded by Chinese astronomers. And it would have been seen by everyone in the world, because you could see this star in the daytime. Um, but of course, most of the records were lost, except in China, and I think in Korea. Um, anyway, so we know exactly what day this occurred. This star is, uh, this is the debris from the star coming out, and you can actually see the little 
blobs move from year to year if you take the picture uh, later on with the Hubble. So we confirm the picture. So this is a star that did blow up. This material will go out into space and be recycled into future generations of stars and planets. And maybe if there are people over there, they will, their lives will be enriched by the chemicals in this particular explosion. Here's one closer to home. This is in the Orion Nebula. If you look at the middle star in the sword of Orion, it's actually this glowing dust cloud and gas cloud. There are stars inside that are brand new and they are lighting it up. So this is a place astronomers always go to look because it's so near and so bright and so easy to study um, and beautiful. So here's a picture taken by my friends. They built a small telescope. The te telescope is only about um, 15 inches in diameter, uh, but nevertheless was able to survey the entire sky and make beautiful images of, uh, of the gas and dust clouds out there too. So it's kind of a finder telescope. Um, they discovered a star that's actually colder than the Earth and quite nearby. So who'd have thought that? Now I want to show you another mystery that turned up recently. Um, the uh, universe is slowing down, everyone thought, because the gravity of the galaxies has to be pulling them back together. That's what this chart shows. Turned out not to be true. The universe is actually speeding up, uh, and how would we know that? These folks measured it. Um, they did it with the standard candle method. They measured uh, distant stars that blow up, like that one that I just showed you. Turns out uh, they're enough alike that you can use them as standard candles. So they said uh, the distant uh, stars are 20% fainter than they should be. So they must be about 10% farther away than we thought. So the history of the expansion must be incorrect. So they went and got their Nobel Prize in 2011 for dis discovering this fact. And as they've, this uh, rapid acceleration is now called the dark energy, um, which is an astronomer's uh, way of pretending that we don't of pretending that we know what's happening. In fact, nobody has a clue. Um, there have been theories that predicted this, but they were about 120 orders of magnitude off, which is about as bad as you could possibly get. <laughs> so uh, we do not know why this should be. Um, but nevertheless, we, need to, we know that we want to figure it out. So NASA is actually going to build another observatory, and so is Europe, uh, to go tackle that question. Now I'm going to get to the current project of, that I'm working on, the James Webb Space Telescope, um, which uh, will take these discoveries and uh, go into the future. So this is the one, um, I've actually been working on it for almost 20 years next month. It'll be 20 years. Um, shortly after we launched the Hubble, we said, now what are we going to do? What can the Hubble not answer? So the astronomers got together, they wrote a report, it's very poetic. And they said, build us a telescope that's even bigger, but can observe infrared light that the Hubble cannot see. Uh, so uh, why would you want to study infrared light? Well, it shows you a different world. Uh, it shows you a world uh, from the most distant universe. The faraway galaxies send us light that we only pick up as infrared. So if you really want to go as far back in time as you could, need an infrared telescope. If you want to see those uh, nearby objects like the Earth that are cool, that emit infrared, got to get an infrared telescope. So build us one of those, please. And the other thing they asked for was, please figure out how to find Earth-like planets out there. So we've been working on that. We haven't quite got there, but we're getting it. So anyway, this telescope is enormous. Uh, the telescope uh, diameter of the mirror is uh, more than from floor to ceiling here in this room. It's about 20, uh, 21 feet across. Um, and it's this big gold hexagon up here. Uh, light from the universe bounces off the mirror focused into here, bounces onto there, and gets analyzed. So this is a huge international project. Uh, NASA is working on it with European and Canadian space agencies. They're all chipping in their bits. Uh, it has instrument package would take, cam would take images, spread out the light into the rainbows and get the spectrum and look at all those chemicals, figure out the motions of the distant universe, and uh, we're getting there. It's, we're just three years from launch, three years from today we should be standing on a little island in French Guiana where it will be launched by the European Space Agency's rocket uh, called the Ariane. That's actually in French Guiana. It's a little bit of France in South America. So then um, um, show you a little bit more. of the, Here is the man that I was telling you about that told us how to go to the moon. Uh, not only did that, but it got us started with the Mariner and the Pioneer 
uh, explorations of the planets, and um, totally astonishing fellow. So if you want to study how to make the world different, read the book about him. <coughs> uh, here's a chart that explains that our telescope is large. <laughs> I don't really need a chart for that. Here's where I'm going to put a telescope. Uh, the telescope. We're putting it in deep space. So the Hubble telescope is a few hundred miles above the Earth's surface, orbiting around every uh, 100 minutes or so. Uh, the uh, new telescope will be a million miles out there, and it will orbit around the sun once a year and the Earth once a year. So it basically hangs out in space. Here's the sun, here's the Earth, there's the moon going around it, and there's the Lagrange point L2, it called. The telescope orbits around there. So we put it out there. Uh, it's a good place to keep the telescope because it doesn't get any farther away. It's overhead at midnight. It's easy to talk to it. And now I'll show you our major engineering challenge. This is what the telescope has to do after we launch it. First comes out the solar panels, then the uh, antenna to transmit back to Earth. Now beginning the, uh, well, these are protective uh, panels that would protect the telescope. We call it a sun shield. It will actually take us uh, weeks to do this process that I'm showing you in a couple of minutes. This will all happen by remote control. No astronaut will be there. We're unrolling the protective covers here. So this is our scary movie. Um, if you're a, a scientist, you say, oh, that's wonderful that you're going to do that. If you're an engineer, you say, oh my god, how am I going to prove that it works? If you're the budget guy, you say, how am I ever going to get enough money to make that happen? Um, and at the end, we will forget all that, and we will be so proud that it works. So what you see now is that the uh, sun shield has five different layers to protect the telescope. Hundreds of kilowatts of sunshine fall on the warm side. A few milliwatts gets through to the cool side. Telescope will be cold. It will cool itself off to about 40 degrees Kelvin. And it should run. We're carrying fuel for 10 years of operation. So we're getting there. Uh, we have made some practice equipment. Uh, we have uh, a test device. Uh, this is uh, part of the carbon fiber frame. We practiced moving it around in our clean room at Goddard. This is going to happen in space. Uh, but we've got to practice, we've got to rehearse. So here on the ground, we have to do a few things uh, to help it, because in outer space, there's no gravity. We have to have cables that sort of hold the parts up against gravity, so you can see how it really would be in outer space. But you can see that it nearly reaches to the top of our clean room at Goddard, which is one of the biggest clean rooms in the world. So this is a couple of days' work compressed here as well. So how are we going to make sure that it really works and that it's in focus when we launch and not like that Hubble Space Telescope? We have to take it down to Johnson Space Flight Center in Houston, Texas, and put the telescope up there. And so uh, what we see here is a drawing uh, of the telescope at the bottom of the big vacuum tank looking up at the top where the test equipment will be. Uh, this is a historic artifact. This chamber was used by the Apollo astronauts to get ready to step out of their capsule onto the surface of the moon. So we had to get permission from the Park Service to change a historic artifact. So anyway, we're going. Three years from now, we should go up. Now I want to give you a hint of what we might see when we get out there. Uh, here is a movie made by supercomputer experts of what the early universe might be doing. So they've got our sort of artificial perspective here uh, with a piece of early universe rotating in front of our camera lens. And what you see is gravity acting on those hot and cold spots in the Big Bang material, pulling galaxies together into these giant stringy structures, which, uh, well, a few people might have thought of it, but mostly astronomers never would have guessed that this is how the structure of the universe is. And so uh, over the course of the first few billion years, the matter just sort of falls together. Um, 
then the stars start to light up. You begin to see explosions in the middles of the galaxies. See, even there's not only filamentary but flat surfaces in there. Explosions going on. Uh, not only stars blowing up, but uh, black holes going off. Uh, when a black hole forms, uh, it liberates immense amounts of energy as stuff falls in. So this is about the universe is about five billion years old here in this movie, and. Uh, it's a spectacular thing to imagine. So this is not Hollywood. This is scientists trying to get it right. Um, but of course, how would you know if you do get it right in the movie? You have to go take a picture. So um, this is a new, a new tool that we didn't have a few years ago, a uh, computer that might almost get it right. But if you ask the people, did they get it right, they will say, of course not. Um, the universe is just much too complicated for us to get it right with a simulation the first time. And it's way too expensive to try it very often. So uh, please go take a picture and tell us what to change so we get it a better movie next time. Then here the universe is about 9 billion years old. That's about when the solar system formed. Um, things are quieting down there. Not so much going on. We're newbies, by the way. The, we've only been here, our whole solar system has only been here for one third of the history of the universe. Now, this universe sure looks a lot different from what it was when it was young, doesn't it? Of course, when you take a picture uh, and you're looking in a particular direction, you're looking at a com combination of everything that you can see from now back to the beginning of, of the universe. And so you have to do a little bit of unscrambling to f tell if that movie is correct. So I've got another movie for you. Um, let's see if I can get this one to go. This one is probably in our future. That beautiful Andromeda Nebula that you can see with your own eye, um, the right season, I think it's actually this season you can see the Andromeda Nebula um, with binoculars. It's coming toward us. Edwin Hubble knew that, that it was coming toward us too. Uh, we measured the velocity quite well. In about a couple of billion years, this will be happening to us. These two beautiful galaxies, uh, two great spiral nebulae, will come at each other and they will combine in this cosmic collision. Now, which way is the sun and the earth going to go? We do not know. Pretty likely that they will end up in the middle, but maybe not. Because you can see that some of that uh, original stuff has been thrown out, but now you can see some of it is also falling back in. Watch those little dots falling back in. And now the movie is showing you that there is a merger of the black holes in the middle of the galaxies, and violent things happen. So this is fairly likely to happen. Uh, if you're an astronomer alive in a few billion years, you'll have lots to talk about. <laughs> and it certainly will be beautiful. So just a few other things to mention. Uh, nature has given us extra lenses for our telescope. Uh, Einstein told us it would be, but was sure we would never find it. Um, anyway, what we see here is all these beautiful yellow galaxies. Uh, and they have so much gravitational force, they're able to bend light. And this, see this little curve up here? It's actually a little teeny weeny, teeny weeny galaxy that's much farther away, and it's been magnified by the lens, lensing action of the gravitational force of all these other beautiful galaxies. So we've got hundreds of these that we now know about, and so this is one of the ways we have to look even farther back in time. Close to home, uh, this is one of our more beautiful pictures from NASA. It's called the Eagle Nebula. Uh, stars have just been born inside, and they're glowing brightly. Um, but you can't see inside. That dust is obscuring our view. Uh, infrared light will go through the dust cloud and give us a very different picture. So astronomers are planning to use the infrared capability to see how stars are born as we speak. And this is just an illustration of that. Also close to home, we'll be looking at planets. Um, and so every once in a while, a planet will go in front of its star and block some starlight. And when it does that, we can tell. So we have an observatory up there called Kepler, which found thousands of these. And m many of them have been confirmed. They're real planets out there. There are even a few that are a little bit like Earth, about the right size and temperature. If a planet is really bright and it goes behind its star, and sometimes this plan the star blocks the planet's light. 
And the coolest thing about all of this is you can analyze what's going on and uh, once in a while tell about the chemicals that are in the atmosphere of those planets out there. Longer term, <coughs> we want to go build more telescopes to find more about those little planets out there. How much, how rare are we? We know we're here, so intelligent life in the universe is possible, <coughs> but how far away are the neighbors? These days, if you ask people, most of them will say, of course, there must be others out there. But honestly, we don't know uh, how, how common our situation is. The Earth does seem to be special. So how special is it? Well, go have a look. Build a telescope that could find planets around other stars and tell us about them. So uh, here is one. We've, we know that we're building this telescope. And we're putting equipment in it to, tell, to block the bright starlight and look for faint planets next to it. Uh, we would like to build that telescope on the right-hand side there. A uh, new report came out. Uh, we're calling it the High Definition Space Telescope. So if you want to know more about why this would be cool, Google High Definition Space Telescope. Um, could see those planets. Could see if they have oxygen. Uh, here on Earth, we have oxygen because of plants and algae. So uh, there's something to eat if you're an animal. <clears throat> if uh, you could find another planet out there that has that, you'd say, well, maybe they're alive. Maybe they're a lot like Earth. Another way to look for planets out there is to build one of these. <coughs> build a giant sunflower with pointy petals and put it uh, 50,000 miles away from your telescope and cast a shadow of the star so you can see the little planets glowing next to it. Well, it's hard work, but we actually know what to do. And my engineering friends have actually designed the little petals and made them unfold. So it could be coming. Maybe that's one of the things we'll try next. This could happen. Eventually, we'll see that. So just to wrap up, we'll, we'll have questions in a moment. Um, you could say, well, how far can we go? Humans would like to go traveling. Uh, we seem to love to travel. Um, so obviously, the big thing is happening. We're making robots everywhere. They are digging up the oil at the bottom of the ocean. They are exploring the planets. Um, they go into uh, nuclear reactors when we have a problem. <coughs> and they can go places we can't go. Um, Robert Ballard, who explores the bottom of the ocean, sits in his office and drives his robot. So they're getting better and better. And I think they're going to go a lot of places we can't go so soon. People are just as fragile as we were 100,000 years ago when our ancestors turned up. Um, we do not like space uh, in person. We need spacesuit. We need protection from cosmic rays. Uh, we need gravity, probably. Uh, so anyway, uh, but I think we're doing everything necessary to create artificial intelligence. And it's probably only a matter of time till it gets here. And we'll find out whether we like it or not. Um, but I'm afraid that uh, in long term, uh, we can't still, we're not likely to find wormholes that take us to other stars. So uh, those wonderful stories that we see on TV, probably not true. <clears throat> but on the other hand, if a robot wants to go to another star, he doesn't have to breathe. Just say, well, robot, do you want to go? Robot says, yeah, I want to go. I'm going to build a spaceship. I'm going to go. It could happen. Then you say, robot, uh, can you put me together when we get there? And the robot would say, well, maybe. Are you nice? <laughs> would I like to have a human companion on my trip? Uh, we'll find out. So thanks for coming for the story. And I'll be happy to have questions. Ah, OK. Well, two really hard questions. Um, and I don't honestly know the answer. But the, the, the first question about are there parallel universes I think it's not an answerable question from the data that we have. Uh, we have beautiful maps of the sky. And people look at them and say, I think it means this. And other people say, no, I don't think so. So we're still arguing about that one. Uh, the other question that you asked about many universes, I guess that's your question. Um, we probably can't tell from anything that I've ever heard of if there are other universes. But there are mathematical predictions that ours is not the only one. The uh, whatever it is that got our early universe expanding very rapidly uh, might have caused many others to do the same. And uh, as far as we can tell, there's no way we would ever see any evidence of that. But you should uh, once in a while believe the mathematicians. Uh, Dirac gave us an equation that said there would be um, antimatter 
and there was antimatter. Uh, but we don't, want, we don't want to tell you all the wrong predictions we made. <laughs> okay, are you asking whether we see local expansion? Yes. Um, <clears throat> curiously enough, we don't. Uh, we have never seen any sign of the expansion, in, with, say, within the solar system. We measure the orbits of the planets within the solar system, and at first we got perfect agreement, then we got measurements better, and we said, no, that doesn't fit anymore. We need relativity, so we put in Einstein's relativity, now everything fits perfectly. So there's no sign within the solar system of the expansion of the universe. It was one of the first things to try, but we can't see it here. We can only see it by seeing the distant universe running away from us. Yeah, so the question is, when can you launch? And the answer is that we, we have many windows we can launch on. Quite a few different days if it's around the equinox. But if it's uh, midsummer or midwinter, there are not very many chances. And uh, it's because of the tilt of the Earth spin and where the launch site is at the equator. So anyway, we're planning on October launch. So we still have chances then. It's quite a few days in October. If you go into November, not too many chances. So anyway, let's fi figure that the government doesn't close so we can keep on working. <laughs> yeah. And curiously enough, uh, NASA is forbidden from working when the government closes. So please don't let that happen. <clears throat> so um, maybe one more question? OK. What limits the life of the telescope oh. for 10 years, and what can you do to enhance it? Uh, what limits the life to 10 years, and what can we do to enhance it? Uh, we have fuel on board, which is necessary for two purposes. One is to maintain the orbit, because the orbit is unstable. Lagrange found this orbit, uh, but it's not stable. So if you don't do the right thing, you'll fall off. And the other one is the sunshine pushes on the telescope. And it's not such a small force. So if the force is not balanced, the tel telescope tries to tumble over. So eventually, you might have to fire the jets. To, uh, to take care of that. So it's rocket jets for two purposes. And so we budgeted for, uh, for 10 years. Uh, if we are lucky with the launch, we'll have more fuel. Um, and if we learn how to steer better, we'll have more fuel. Because uh, both of these are things where you could learn how to drive better. So I'm hopeful that we'll have 15 or 20 years, but I can't promise you that. So uh, I guess uh, we should probably complete. And thank you very much for coming. I love talking with you about this. And uh, uh, if you want to, by the way, uh, Goddard is having an open house. So if anybody's in Washington, D.C. or you have friends in Washington, D.C. on the 26th, which is just two weeks away, um, we'll be wide open. Thousands of people will come. You, your friends could be some of them. Let's give Dr. Mather a big hand. Thank you.